Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. We've been non-stop on benchmarking GPUs and Starfield, and we're already looking at the next couple games, like Cyberpunk coming up. But for now, we have a huge amount of news for the past week, and it's, it's actually, uh, the teaser here is that Unity basically torpedoed itself. So that's a fun topic. Uh, we'll also be talking about Lee and Lee suing Fantax and Thermal Take, Arc getting better, so something on the positive side, and AMD's 96 core Threadripper rumors uh, getting deeper still. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Deepcool and the new Zero Dark series of AK620 and AK400 CPU coolers. We previously reviewed the AK620 and AK400 and found them to be among a new crop of extremely competitive coolers for the price. The new Zero Dark and Zero Dark Plus variations move out to a blackout color design with blackout FDB fans. The heatsinks otherwise have the same characteristics as those that we tested previously and found to be well performing, just with a fresh new look. Learn more at the link in the description below. First thing, we have a quick GN store update. So you may have seen it in our, our uh, Starfield coverage, but last week we were super proud and excited to launch our GN15 large mod mat. That's this one right here. This is the latest edition of our large anti-static mod mat series. And we wanted to talk for just a minute about this because super fun project as always. It took us about a year of sort of design and development going back and forth on it, and it finally arrived. And uh, we're, we're thrilled with how it came out because it looks great. And in terms of uh, like our quality for mod mats keeps going up and uh, it's, it's cool. It's cool to see it. So this also directly supports our operation and buying the mod mats in addition to getting you a PC building service to work on is what makes it possible for us to expand our testing for things like all the new hemianechoic chamber benchmarking. So these were made for our GN15, or our 15-year anniversary, and they're a limited run of large anti-static mod mats. These will directly fund our next year of testing and equipment. As you've seen with our recent push with peer-reviewed acoustic testing, we're really taking it seriously more than ever now, and we were already pretty serious about it. So we use the hemianechoic chamber and the fractal terra, the ally reviews, that chamber's basically made out of mod mats, uh, not literally, but financially. So we're putting the mod mat sales to work for content, and we appreciate your support on them. This one is another four foot by two foot surface, or 1220 by 610 millimeters. We have a new set of helpful diagrams on it and organizational systems to make your PC building easier while offering an anti-static conductive surface that has a high heat resistance. That makes it useful for other projects, like whatever Vitalia was doing in this B-roll, or the more common heat guns for water cooler tube bending. The new mat has a screw tracking grid with GPU silhouettes. It's got screw sorter sort of trays in the top left, a cool Zen CPU cross-section diagram for something educational, a new pinout diagram for common motherboard front panel connectors to make it a little easier to work with the most annoying connector in a computer, 8P8C wiring diagrams, and this one has four common ground point snaps, one in each corner, so you can move around all sides of the table and keep the strap out of the way. And these have been selling super fast with our launch last week, so if this is your first time hearing about it, consider grabbing one to help fund our recent big push into deep dive reviews like you saw with the Terra and the Ally. And as always, you can grab them on store.gamersnexus.net. Massive thank you to everyone who has supported us over the years by picking up the stuff uh, that we sell so we can further push for independent reviews and try to limit our reliance on advertisers, as always. First big story, Unity. Unity nukes itself. So uh, the Unity game engine landed itself in very hot water the past couple days for some updates it made to its pricing policy. This is something that directly affects the developers and probably indirectly affects consumers of the games that those developers make. Now, Unity noted that it is adding a runtime fee based on game installs. They have a table for it and everything. That makes it official. In addition to fees for software utilities and cloud-based storage, Unity will be charging per install. Critically, the company has decided that the smallest developers, like independent or solo game devs, will be subject to paying 20 cents per installation, or 2 cents, in what Unity calls emerging markets. Now, these charges are if the game developer hits a threshold of $200,000 or more, and then there's a cheaper threshold in terms of cost per install at higher dollar amounts. So this disproportionately affects smaller developers. At $200,000 for 12 months is really, if you think about it on the scale of a business, so you have a couple developers who are trying to make their first big break, their first couple video games or whatever, 
you, you have a couple people, 200 grand is gone pretty fast just if they want to have a living wage. And that's especially true if they have external development costs. Maybe they're buying their music or they're buying assets for the game. Uh, they are buying servers or storage systems, renting an office, anything like that. It makes 200K basically pennies before they start getting hit by these extra charges. So, so the threshold the, between zero and 200 really only protects sort of hobbyists. And uh, as, as soon as there's a little bit of a sign of success and uh, just enough for a developer to look at the money coming in and go, hey, maybe I can do this full time. Maybe this is a real thing I can do. They get hit with more fees. And it's in a way that um, it just, it seems exorbitant for, for like the, the revenue threshold is relatively low for what this is, which is a business arrangement and the fees are exorbitant. So it'd be possible for an uh, adequately angered group likewise to maliciously cause financial harm to developers by uh, doing uninstalls and, and installs. And now you kind of clarified on this point later, which we'll get to, but the point is that a unit of installation is a, a very sort of strange way to gauge how the developer should be charged. When it originally posted this blog post of changes, Unity was very unclear how it might validate one install versus another. In its early clarifications it posted, now that it's done a few rounds of those, which is always a great sign, uh, it committed that uninstalls and reinstalls or hardware swaps such as new SSDs or a new OS by the same user would be affected by the fee. That's changed, sort of, but that was the original clarification. But to put that into perspective, if a developer sells a user a $10 game, and let's assume there's zero publishing cost, Valve feels so great about their game, they don't take any money for it. You can keep 100% of your 10 bucks. Even in this situation, if that user then goes and installs this game five times over the next year or whatever, they have uh, a Steam Deck, they have a home PC, they have an away from home PC, they have a laptop, uh, and then maybe they uninstall it at one point and then install it again four months later because they got bored and they got reinterested. That user has now cost the developer 10% of the original total revenue, gross revenue from that user for the game, ignoring all other costs whatsoever, which is insane. The worst part is that it's functionally an unpredictable cost. Now, the thresholds are different for large businesses, as they often are, and generally much more favorable per install. It's kind of weird. Big businesses have the most to spend, but they're probably also the highest flight risk to making their own engine or defecting to an alternative, as they likely have a stronger foundation in place to support that kind of move. And of course, they'd have better negotiating power against Unity. Now, on the percentage-based side of things, obviously, larger developer pays more money when it's some kind of royalty percentage. So, for example, Epic Games has a royalty percentage that it does. And this can make sense if, for example, the engine developer is suddenly providing a lot more support to the game developer. Maybe in the case of Epic, they're providing one-on-one -on -one custom tuning support of the engine to support whatever big AAA game it is. So, okay, it's a little bit different there. But the per-install cost is the one that's really interesting here. Now, the good news is that Unity has heard these concerns. And uh, to those concerns, Unity, I'll summarize it for you. They posted a big tweet, tweet longer thing. But to summarize it, Unity said, we've heard your concerns and fuck you, you're wrong. Oh, they didn't say that. They said, it's your fault. You got confused. So Unity clarified, if anyone was confused by this to begin with, now it's no longer confusing, according to their opening sentence for their correction, sorry, the clarifications. The installation fee, Unity clarified, as if anyone was even confused by this to begin with, isn't ongoing. It only happens every time someone installs the game. So great, only part of what everyone was mad about is true, and the made-up straw man part that they shoved in there is not true, and no one was worried about it to begin with. Unity also provided more clarity on how they count installations. The company noted that it will not charge a fee for reinstalls, but it's unclear how it might verify a reinstall or over what period of time that extends. If they mean the literal repair slash reinstall option, then that seems less likely to be used these days. 
and won't really protect anyone. It also said it won't charge for fraudulent installs, which doesn't help at all. There's no method for proactively identifying fraudulent installs or of pirated installs. Unity summed it all up by saying not to worry. Only 10% of their customers will be held hostage against the new policy. In other news, while looking for Unity's statements, we stumbled across a Yahoo Finance article from before this news broke. On September 6th, Unity's president and CEO sold 2,000 shares of Unity Software Incorporated, the maker of Unity Engine. Yahoo Finance pointed out that Unity's insider trades involved 49 sales year to date with zero buys. Yahoo then must be clairvoyant because it said, quote, this could be a red flag for potential investors as it suggests that those with the most intimate knowledge of the company's operations and prospects are choosing to sell their shares. And most recently, Unity posted another apology, an apology apology, and they said, quote, we've heard you. We apologize for the confusion and the <laughs> angst. Wow, it smells like corporate spirit. The runtime fee policy we announced on Tuesday caused. We are listening, talking to our team members, community, customers, and partners, and we're making changes to the policy. We'll share an update in a couple of days. Thank you for your honest and critical feedback. Ultimately though, as a publicly traded company, Unity's boss isn't the customer. Unity's boss is the shareholders, and this move on paper makes Unity more money. So the shareholders should be happy, uh, except for one problem. And it's the problem that the, the, this whole shareholder argument always falls apart over, which is longer term, what damage does this cause? So Unity at this point has broken trust of smaller developers especially, uh, but there's a lot of large, very successful games on the list of Unity games now. It's not a small engine. It's one of the most competitive and widely used engines in the gaming industry. They at this point are at risk of potentially destroying long-term trust that has been built and permanently losing developers who are at this moment jumping ship. Anyway, up next, Lee and Lee has filed two lawsuits, one against Fantex and one against Thermaltake, and these are regarding what Lee and Lee alleges is patent infringement or intellectual property infringement of its PC fan designs. Uh, we've actually re-engaged with Vincent Augusta, the attorney who joined us to discuss the ASUS warranty and uh, RMA choices previously, and he'll be coming back in about a week or so to discuss these details of these cases in some more depth and hopefully answer some specific questions about how this stuff works, but also what the implications are. Uh, but that'll be a separate content piece. We can still lay the groundwork here though. So foundationally, Lee and Lee began this skirmish in May of this year. It sent some initial probably demand letters or a cease and desists to Fantax and Thermal Take, but it has since escalated those to lawsuits. Lee and Lee's patent was registered in 2020 and the patent specifically protects illuminated fans and uh, what Lee and Lee is going for here is assuming the defendants can't prove prior art or invalidate its patent. Uh, it, it hopes to bring the patent to bear against fans that are LED illuminated, interlocking and use smart connection. So not just a four pin PWM connector to a motherboard. For the affected fans, they are Fantax's D30s. These don't connect exactly the same way as Lee and Lee's do, but uh, there are some similarities. And then also Thermal Takes SWA fan. In theory, Lian Li could next escalate to Corsair. Now that's assuming it thinks it can take on Corsair's effectively unlimited resources by comparison. It could also, in theory, target Arctic for the Bionics fans released previously. Now the suit states this, quote, the 336 patent, illumination fan connectable with at least one illumination fan for a computer, was duly and legally issued on June 23rd, 2020. Lee and Lee's suit shows figure two in this document from its patent filing to showcase the connectable nature of the fans. The suit shows the Fantex D30 fans for at least the Fantex lawsuit, and it states, quote, as shown, the D30 fan includes an illumination fan connectable with at least one other illumination fan for a computer. The illumination fan comprises a body provided with a fan in the center of the body, an illumination area on at least two sides of the fan at the top of the body, a power socket and a first connector on one side of the body, and a second connector on the other side of the body. 
The power socket is electrically connected with the first connector, the second connector, the fan, and the illumination area, such that when the power socket on the one side of the body is supplied with power, the fan and the illumination area of the body are respectively driven into rotation and illumination. The suit filed against Thermaltake is similar and alleges IP infringement of Lian Li and Thermaltake's new Swafan X models, and in the time since the suit was filed, at least Fantex, thus far at time of filming, has responded to Lian Li publicly, and Fantex stated the following, quote, we at Fantex can confirm the filing of the patent infringement suit filed by a fellow PC enthusiast brand. We want to inform the community that our legal team is and has always properly handled any legal issues or communication issues that arose. From the start of the Fantex D30 fan development, we set out to design an original product that innovates to provide new solutions to PC enthusiasts. We have consulted with patent lawyers during the development and prior to the announcement of the D30 fans, and the fans were not found to infringe on the claims in the patent. Fantex D30 fans are an original idea and have been issued patents in multiple countries to date. We value and respect valid and enforceable IP rights and are confident that the result of this legal matter will confirm there is no infringement. We will continue our mission to serve the PC community by creating unique and innovative solutions. There's one other complication here too, which is that Lee and Lee showed off its Unifan designs prior to launching them, and uh, we'll go and check for the video with Vincent Augusta, but the amount of time before the official availability was fairly extensive by harbor manufacturer standards uh, because I remember seeing the first models of them at CES, I think it was, and we saw that pretty well in advance of them coming out, like a year plus. So that further complicates it, uh, but the actual filing and granting of the patent is probably the, the main relevant date here, and we'll talk with uh, the attorney joining us about that. So the real question here is whether they existed in the format described in the patent documents within only the eyes of the law, ignoring sort of the eyes of the enthusiast who might look at two things and go, they're effectively the same. Why is this special? It's, it's the law that matters here. And again, that's what we're, uh, why we brought an expert in for the next video on this. For some prior legal history in the industry, there've been a couple suits like this in the past. Ace Attack is probably the most famous. They were at least at the time the industry's number one supplier for AIO liquid cooling solutions. So they would provide the radiator, the tubes, the pump, the pump block housing, the microfins, all that stuff, and work with the manufacturer to customize it, but it was ultimately supplied by Asetech. And Asetech actually successfully, in a number of instances, including against Cooler Master, was able to bring its patent to bear. Uh, so for example, it sued Cooler Master successfully, it went all the way through court, it wasn't just settled, uh, and they won. And they kept winning until they lost. And then it seems like his tech kind of stopped taking that approach, at least as far as we've followed it for recent years. And they've kind of fallen off compared to where they were. But that's one of the more famous cases. Uh, Case Labs and Thermal Take would be another one. As a final point here, all three of these companies are currently advertisers with us on the channel. So we have Lian Lee and Fantex running case ads right now, and Thermal Take is running fan ads. Uh, we don't plan on making any changes on our end as is right now or monitoring it, obviously, as it develops. But for the time being, at a product level, all of the three products that we've approved for them to, we basically allowed them to advertise on the channel, pass our product quality standards. Uh, and so, you know, as far as a consumer perspective goes, this doesn't change any of that. But we will be following it directly. Uh, and I'm excited to get Vincent Augusta on to talk about it. Okay, next story is a rumor from HKEPC, which this week published a rumor that October 17th will mark the launch date for Intel's 14th gen CPUs, or its 14,000 series. These will presumably be the last major desktop parts with the core i series branding before Intel moves over to its Intel 357 and whatever else it does naming scheme. Uh, so these are, are going to be desktop. Interestingly, they are also rumored to be compatible with the Z600 and Z700 series motherboards, so Z690, Z790, which will expand the compatibility of those platforms that are technically a few generations old now uh, to support one more generation at least. Now, overall, the most interesting CPU, at least by on paper spec to us, is the 14700K. And that one's interesting because they're changing not just the frequency, but the actual core count. Uh, and it's higher over the 13700K. So, that may make it particularly relevant in terms of seeing a generational uplift that's more exciting than we would see just from clocks alone. And beyond that, there's not really much other news on this front. All of the details about which CPUs there are have been leaked, the specs have been leaked, 
we'll see obviously if they're all right, but it's, it's so close to launch that they're probably pretty accurate at this point. So we expect to be testing them and publishing reviews on them soon, assuming this October 17th date holds. Up next, one of Cyberpunk's developers this past week took to Twitter to warn everyone that the upcoming 2.0 patch for Cyberpunk and the Phantom Liberty DLC are going to actually use the CPU cores that they have available to them. The warning was of performance, and CDPR's Philippe Pierczynski tweeted this, quote, before release, Cyberpunk 2077 2.0 and Phantom Liberty, please check conditions of your cooling systems in your PC. We use all that you have. So workload on an eight core CPU of 90% is expected. To save your time, please run Cinebench or similar and check stability of your systems. Now in the thread, the developer also confirmed that SMT and hyperthreading will now work properly, saying, quote, it will be natively supported, no more mod needed. Now after this, there was clearly a company inspired or encouraged follow-up that stated that Cyberpunk won't melt PCs because apparently some people read way too far into tweets and somehow thought that was the outcome of it. Either way, that tweet contained Phantom Liberty's recommended system specs, and that includes an i7-12700 or an R7-7800, which doesn't exist, although the Steam page indicates a 7800X 3D as recommended. We noticed that there's an earlier version of this image from the tweet as well, where CDPR originally did reference a 78X 3D, so the one Philippe shared here may have been edited for some reason. Doesn't matter. Either way, it's relevant. The point is, that they're suggesting an R7 or an i7 from a recent generation. Interestingly, in the image, unlike Bethesda, CDPR does acknowledge that Intel Arc exists and even lists it. It has it under minimum with the A380, recommended with the A770, and RT minimum with the A750. Now, some of the listings confuse us, just, it's just, it's normal recommended and minimums that you see for video games. So uh, they don't all make sense, at least on paper, but we'll be covering Cyberpunk 2.0 and probably Phantom Liberty as well. In fact, one of the main reasons we're looking to cover it is to get it back into our GPU test suite now that there's going to be a major update, which is also why we've kind of paused for the time being on rerunning it through. All right, next one. We've been waiting for Intel and Adobe to get ARC cards functional for Adobe Premiere. This is actually, it was the very first thing we wanted to do with ARC because we use, internally we use IGPs, so Intel desktop gaming class CPUs, for all of our editing stations, we got rid of the Threadripper ones we had, I mean, we still have the parts, but, uh, and that was because the IGP helps accelerate the rendering for some of the types of edits we do so much that actually becomes more useful than just a massive CPU. Uh, and the IGP does things that sometimes a CUDA-based GPU won't do, at least not quickly or as quickly, like with NVIDIA cards. So we use a mix of NVIDIA and Intel IGPs for our editing machines. And we wanted to use Arc in there uh, as hopefully an accelerator, basically, for some of this quick sync type of rendering, but it hasn't worked. That has just recently changed, and Adobe Premiere has now added support, and there's also driver support for a couple of other applications. So Puget Systems used its test suite to evaluate Arc card performance for video editing in Adobe Premiere, DaVinci Resolve, Blender, Unreal Engine, After Effects, and more. Puget found in Adobe Premiere that the A770 and A750 outperformed a 4060 Ti and approached 4070 levels of performance in its extended overall score. The GPU effects score separately allowed the 4070 to still hold a large lead. And interestingly, Intel's cards outpaced the 4070 in H.264 and HEVC testing for Premiere. Puget Systems also found that the ARC cards now work in DaVinci Resolve, whereas they previously didn't work at all. This was the work of Intel's driver team. The rest of the tests are less favorable for ARC, but Premiere is a good start. From what we've seen so far though, modern IGPs plus NVIDIA GPUs may still be the best combination mostly due to the way Premiere is programmed to cycle through cards. But Arc is now starting to become viable. Up next, recent rumors indicate that Nintendo held some behind closed doors meetings at Gamescom showing a Nintendo Switch 2, or at least that's what the internet has dubbed it. Uh, internet can count to two, we'll see if it can count to three. Depends on if we've learned from Valve or not. Following this rumor, leaker Copite 7 q posted die shots of the T234 silicon with an assertion that, quote, Nintendo will use a customized one, T239. Another leaker, Kepler underscore L2, posted a link to a GitHub page that lists GPUs under the Ampere Class B category. 
That list includes T234 and T239. Nintendo has been using Tegra chips for the Switch for a while now, and if the current rumors prove true, its new Switch 2 would move to NVIDIA or an SOCs on Samsung 8 nanometer process. Tom's hardware put together a useful specs table to detail the known and unknown specs, the most notable entry here is the migration away from the very dated Maxwell architecture used in desktops on the GTX 900 series cards and some 700 series launches. Nintendo will be moving to Ampere, known best for its 30 series desktop cards, and that series predates the current ADA architecture by one generation. This would be a massive architectural leap and would pull Nintendo's hardware into the modern era. Tom's hardware also points to a 2048 CUDA core solution if all this is true with clocks yet unknown. So that'd be a big boost in performance versus what Nintendo's on now. One of the other really interesting changes here is that this Ampere architecture will support DLSS. So Nintendo potentially opens up the possibility to leverage DLSS, which could be helpful in a couple of ways. One is obviously just the raw boosting of frame rate through say frame generation, if that's functional on it. Uh, and if not, just running a, a lower resolution and then upscaling it. But the other option is using it as a battery saving feature. So uh, if Nintendo goes the route of, say, in, in handheld mode, generating fewer real frames and relying more on frame generation, again, if this technology is functional in it, which architecturally it should be, then that could be a savings for battery life if Nintendo is able to run the overall power budget lower because it's generating fewer of the so-called real frames. Uh, all right, next one is the AMD 96 core Threadripper leaks. These have been out and about for a while now, but there's more of them at this point. So previous Geekbench leaked benchmark listings from about a month ago originally indicated the upcoming Threadripper CPUs, or did so again. And that's on the TRX 50 platform, which is a new AMD platform for Threadripper. Now, more leaks have firmed up the likelihood of a new Threadripper desktop part for uh, high-end desktop machines, and specifically for a 96-core Threadripper CPU. We've also seen leaks of a 32-core lower-end option. Threadripper has previously capped at 64 cores, like with the 5995WX, and AMD has been careful to not allow Threadripper to cannibalize too much of its epic CPU sales. So moving to an alleged 96 core solution is making a potential self-competitor against AMD's own epic processors, except as usual, the expanded memory and IO support will likely favor epic. The newly leaked CPU is the 7975WX 32 core chip accompanying the previously leaked 7995WX. Clocks and other specs are not yet known in a way we're comfortable with uh, stating as any kind of facts, just because leaks through benchmark suites often have accuracy issues when reporting processors that are not final yet. But an SI software listing also detailed the 7995WX further, spotted by Momomo underscore US. The listing claims 5 plus gigahertz on the frequency. We'll obviously uh, look into that once it launches. And 96 megabytes of L2 with 384 megabytes of L3. We're not sure if any of these numbers can be trusted beyond the name of the CPU, but the part that matters is we're getting closer to a launch. And there's not much to say here other than a Zen 4 thread per CPU is basically guaranteed at this point. It's just a matter of when. Next one up is Bethesda and Starfield. We'll keep this short because we already covered this briefly in our Starfield graphics guide uh, where we benchmarked a bunch of graphics settings. So we covered the basics there, but Bethesda has a patch version 1.7.29 uh, this one only immediately fixes three quest-breaking bugs. It also fixes some Xbox installation issues. Bethesda also says it has a sort of unspecified performance improvements. The bigger part of the patch comes later, which we'll get to. Now, we didn't see any performance impact outside of what we expected from NVIDIA's own rebar profile that it added. And with AMD 7600, we saw no change from uh, what Bethesda called performance improvements. We didn't test them extensively because Bethesda didn't really give any details or make it seem like they were large, but we did those two quick one-offs and saw basically a, like 6% for NVIDIA's rebar changes. The rest of the announcement is future looking, but more interesting. Bethesda says it will be adding an FOV slider, HDR calibration, gamma controls with brightness and contrast, formal DLSS support, 32 by nine ultra wide support, and a button to eat food. We'd assume they mean without navigating through the horribly slow and cluttered menu animations. Who knows? Maybe they mean for true shut-ins who've done nothing but play Starfield since it came out. Don't, don't forget to take breaks to actually eat. Now, for now, these items haven't been added yet, 
Uh, Intel has likewise posted more driver updates following Bethesda saying that Intel Arc didn't meet its minimum requirements, making friends as always. Todd Howard. Uh, but this time, Intel has named Starfield as specifically being a recipient of performance improvements and allowing the game to actually launch now at Intel Arc. NVIDIA's updates, meanwhile, have focused on adding rebar profiles again that gains 5 to 10%, depending on the card. Uh, and then AMD, we haven't heard anything explicitly from at the time of posting this, but we'd be shocked if they didn't have some further improvements in the pipeline as well, although it seems like a lot of this is going to fall on Bethesda. Last one, the Lenovo Legion Go has gotten some more coverage. So the Lenovo Legion Go is an upcoming handheld device. It will be joining the ranks of the GPD Win series, the Aya Neo, the Steam Deck, the ROG Ally, and the like. And while the Legion Go isn't done yet, some media outlets have gotten an early hands-on with a prototype unit or an early production, a pre-production sample. Rock, Paper, Shotgun was one of those outlets. If you haven't read their content and you like gaming, uh, I think their indie games coverage is phenomenal. They find a lot of really good games I've never heard of, and I've, I've liked paying attention to them for many years now because of that. But uh, they had some good coverage of the Legion Go with some initial impressions. So uh, RPS's James Archer wrote up an opinion piece about going hands-on with the Legion Go. We'll leave that for you to read, but the photos are what's interesting to us right now. As shown in prior previews, you can see the detachable controllers on each side, plus a trackpad for some extra sort of PC-style usability, as the Steam Deck also offers. The Legion Go also includes a charging dock for the controllers themselves. We know Nintendo has been extremely litigious about its Joy-Con IP in the past, but presumably a company as large as Lenovo has done enough research to differentiate itself successfully. But with Lee and Lee in the news the way it is, uh, we'll see. There's room for Nintendo to do something similar. Either way, the Legion Go looks like it's going to be one of the next major handhelds that we look at depending on its launch date and timing. Uh, so we'll, we'll be paying attention to that as it further develops. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net, subscribe one of our mod mats and help us out directly, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.